we have lecture number five in the course of um, uh, the challenges and the problems of object-oriented programming. Actually, the course was named originally the pain of object-oriented programming. We discussed things which, uh, which are, which are, in my opinion, they may cause pain and may cause discomfort when you write object-oriented programs. And these things, I list them one by one in the lectures uh, and try to explain why they cause the pain and how do you deal with the pain. So we discussed in the first lecture, we discussed the algorithms, we discussed why uh, the algorithmic and procedural approach uh, attitude to the programs we write in object-oriented languages actually hurts us, actually makes us write code less uh, effectively, less efficiently than we could do it. Then on the second lecture, we discussed static methods and static attributes. So I tried to explain you that when you make a method static or an attribute static, you are uh, introducing troubles into your programs. Then the lecture number three was about getters. So we discussed why taking the data from objects is a bad idea. So the data must be encapsulated and maybe you remember the behavior must be exposed. We encapsulate state, we hide state, and we expose uh, the behavior. The lecture number four, we discuss setters and mutability. So I, uh, I told you that uh, when the, an object is mutable, then uh, this object is uh, difficult to maintain, the object is becoming larger inevitably, and um, a lot of other things uh, related to thread uh, unsafety also will happen there. And now the lecture number five, we're going to discuss objects which are named with the ER in the end. So the ER is maybe, you've heard about these objects which are titled like controller or the object which is called a manager or the object which is called a reader. For example, you say stream reader. So that's the name of, of a class, not an object. Let's, a name. Let's say it's the name of a class. So these suffixes, the ER, the ER, the ER is what is wrong. This is what... Uh, is an indicator of a bad design. And it's not my idea. So uh, I will tell you that, uh, that it is a bad idea, but it's not my idea. I just, uh, I just took it from, the, um, from other people who thought the same, and I only tried to extend this idea and, and uh, illustrate it with more examples. So the structure of the lecture, first I'm going I'm to show you the examples and alternatives, how to get rid of these ER suffixed objects. Then we're going to discuss the client suffix, which in my opinion is kind of a brother of, the, uh, of this ER suffix, is also is a, is a trouble. Then we will discuss what to do with the performance, because many people, when I tell them that ER objects are bad, they, the, the, the question number one they ask is what to do with the performance. Then a few words about model view controller, because as you can see, of course, model view controller is the design pattern which is heavily based on an object called controller, which is, we claim now, today, that is a bad, is a bad design. But this model view controller, the MVC, is the very popular pattern in web development and, uh, uh, and uh, UI uh, applications like desktop, desktop applications, for example, or mobile applications. This MVC is, the, is a central piece of um, these kinds of applications. And I claim that MVC is a bad design pattern, and I'll explain you why. And then I'll show you the example, the, the practical software. I'll show you two frameworks, like actually one application, one framework, where we get rid of ER objects and design everything without these objects. And it's a web, real web application, which is, you know, which is working, which is, uh, which is uh, used by people for more than 10 years, and it's quite stable, and it doesn't have a single ER-ended, ER-suffixed object. So let's start. Let's start with a quote to prove you that I'm not the, the one who invented this. So I found this quote, which in my opinion was the first, so maybe there were other people saying the same, but I found this one uh, being the, the first, the, the, the earliest. And this guy, Carla, is saying that when you need a manager, the manager, pay attention, the R suffix, the manager, uh, it's often a sign that the managed, this manager is managed some, managing somebody, so the managed, are just plain old data structures. Remember, plain old data structures. Remember we talked about that, that we don't want objects to be plain old data structures. We don't want to be just plain old data structures. We want them to be behavioral objects, not dynamic. 
So he is saying exactly about that. Are just plain old data structures and that the manager is the smart procedure, pay attention, procedure doing the real work. So in this quote, we put, Carlo put together everything I'm, I'm going to tell you today. So we don't want somebody, some object to be a, a smart procedure who is managing plain old data structures. We want objects to be smart. We want objects to manage themselves, not some smart procedure staying outside of an object and managing the object. Let's start with an example. Chapter number one. Parser. A super classic example in my opinion. So the parser is on the left. You see the... So first look at this part. Don't look at the right one. Look at the left one. So it's a parser. The parser has to, well, it's it's extremely it's extremely a special case. So the parser is not even a parser, but I would say it's a parsing utils, as you know. So that's the probably the the the, uh, the right name for for this class would be parsing utils. So it has the parse integer and parse float, or maybe if you remove the if you remove the static the static modifier here, then it's going to be a real par a parser. How people usually design it. So there are two parsing, the two methods which are supposed to parse. You put the string as an input, and then it returns you either an integer or a float, you know, depending on, on the method. It's pretty clear how to use it. You say parser dot, well, actually, it's not right. You say, in this case, parser dot, but we can also imagine this. New parser, and then dot, parse, int, and whatever. So you create a parser and then you call this parser, please parse me the integer and return me the, 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 the result. I'm sure you've seen the code like this many times. That's how people design parsing algorithms. When something is coming in and something has to go out, so we say, okay, if this is happening, then of course we need a procedure, remember, smart procedure, which is taking an input, which doesn't understand what's happening to it, it's a plain old data structure, so the, the string has no idea what's inside. The string doesn't know that it actually contains the number, that it actually contains a string representation of a float. It's a completely dumb, anemic piece of data. And this piece of data is coming in. We are smart. The parser is smart. The parser takes the pieces out, de somehow decomposes it into you know, more semantically meaningful uh, elements and then returns back the float. So the smart procedure is the parser, the plain data coming in and some other plain data is coming out. It's not good. It's not good because for many reasons. Because the data doesn't know what it is. The data still remains completely unaware of what it contains. So the smart, the, the logic, the, the, um, the algorithmic part of our program is inside the parser, outside of the object, which actually must uh, contain that uh, must contain that that information. A better alternative is on the right side of the screen. So look at this. So instead of making some parser, we make our data smarter. We encapsulate the data inside the object, which is now be, which behaves now which has additional behavior, additional to what the data had before. So the data is a string. The data didn't know that apparently there's an integer inside. And then we put this data into a larger object, and, and this larger object knows that the, the, the data inside is actually a string. And then we come to this object and say, give me your integer value. So turn yourself into an integer. And it returns the integer. It makes the processing, it parses the data and returns the integer back. And look how we use it. We have the same data here as here. You see 42, the same there. So we encapsulate it into a new object, which has the behavior which we're looking for. And then we pass this object to where we need it to be. And then when it's necessary, somebody else will call, give me the integer value from this object. And the integer value will be returned. So we are we have a lot of advantages on the right script on the right snippet comparing to the left one. I can I can name them. First for example, we uh, in this case if you look at the right snippet, then this n, this variable n, well it's an object. So this object 
uh, is lazy. So the evaluation of the actual uh, integer, so the parsing mechanism, the algorithm, will be executed only when it's necessary. So let's say if between these two lines we're going to have another, I don't know, 50 lines of code. And then maybe some of them will do the, the return. We discussed that before, remember when the, uh, we discussed the, the temporal coupling. So now these, these two things, they, are, they can be completely detached from each other. And, and, and this evaluation is lazy. So when, when and if this method will be called, only then the parsing will happen. So this code on the right is more declarative, much more declarative, while the code on the left is so-called imperative. So the imperative code is when we tell the computer to do exactly what we need right here, right now. The declarative approach is when we declare the intent, we just say we want this to be a parsed string. So we want n to behave like a number which is taken from that string. And it will behave like this, like a number. How exactly it will happen inside? We don't care much. I'll show you now one example, which, is, uh, which will illustrate it even more. But now just compare two pieces. You now see the difference. The parser and an object with the parsing behavior. Instead of making a parser a manager who deals with data, we just extend the data with more behavior. It was not enough for us, the behavior we had. We had just a string, but that's not enough because the string has something inside which is which is more than just a collection of, of characters. We want this collection of characters to become, you know, to become a number. So we we extend the object by decorating or by, by, by composition. It's called extension by composition. So we make a composition of, of two objects. So actually, this is an object. This is the object we had, the string, and this is the object we created. So we had one object and we decorated with a larger one. Then we have two, well, we have a larger object. Another example, reader. Again, look at the text on the left. The reader is, uh, again, it's a static, it's, 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 I'm using static here, so maybe it's not really a, a canonical way of doing this. So here I would say, instead of reader dot, I would say new reader, and then read character, read character. So, but whatever, either you do it this way or either you do that way, static or not static, it doesn't make a big difference because this reader class and usually all these ER classes, they are dateless. So they have no data inside. They only have a collection of procedures. So they rarely encapsulate some valuable data. Usually they just provide uh, functionality. They just expose the behavior encapsulating zero data. So, and that's why, and, and because of this, we can turn them into, into collections of static methods. So look at this. We, we ask this reader to take the input stream as an, as an argument and then read the input stream, take the next character and return this character to us. So how we use it, we say we make the, the input stream there and then we say read one character and the character is returned. So again, the input stream is something which has no behavior which we're looking for. So we had an input stream, but the input stream doesn't have the behavior which we're looking for. We need the stream to be read, and if the stream is finished, then we need to return null. It's not a good idea, we'll discuss null in the next lectures, but let's say for now, for the sake of this conversation, let's say we want this to, to, to we want the functionality which is written there. So read the character, if the stream is empty, then return null. And input stream doesn't have this, this behavior for us. So what do we do? Instead of making an external uh, reader, instead of making a reader which is smart enough to do that with our input stream, which, is, which remains clueless of what's going on. So input stream has no clue how it's being used. Instead, we create a new object, now I'm looking here on the right snippet, which encapsulates the input stream and then, and then introduces two new features, two new behavioral uh, features. I think that's the right word. So now the behavior of this, of this object, the, the, I, I call them characters or cares. So it has the, the method next and we can use the method exists as well. So now the input stream became larger. We extended the input stream, made its functionality bigger. 
and everywhere we go with this input stream, ideally, then who interact with us can enjoy this new functionality. So nobody needs to know about some reader classes. Nobody needs to know about some parser classes. They just deal with me. I was a string, now I'm a string with extra functionality. We need, you need more from me, you need more functionality. Okay, I'm gonna extend myself with a larger object which will provide more functionality to you, more methods, more features. But always talk to me. Don't let anybody who stays outside of me like a reader or a parser to, to take my data and deal with this data, work with this data without letting me know. So that's kind of offensive to the object. So if you, if you understand, if you can anthropomorphize, like imagine the object is an human. So that's quite a common um, the metaphor. When you, in order to understand object-oriented programming, you, you, uh, uh, make a, um, uh, you make an analogy, you make a metaphor that uh, an object is a human being. And then the human being has some knowledge, some information. So it, it would be offensive to this human being to just take this information from, from that human being and then deal with this data and then put this data somewhere else. It would be much more respectful to the human being to ask that human being to work with the data and provide the result to, to me. So that's, that's here what's happening. So don't let, I don't want as an object to let some reader or to let some parser to deal with my data. I'll, I'll do it for you. If you want me to become larger, okay, create a larger object which, which becomes a more smart human, or maybe let's say there's a human who knows something, and then we say this human doesn't know how to, um, I don't know, how to, uh, this human knows something, but another human doesn't know how to make a T. So it knows only how to, how to walk, how to write, how to read, but he doesn't know how to make a cup of tea. So what do we do? We create a larger entity called also sort of a human, but it's, it's going to be like a, like a group of humans, like a human with some additional knowledge. And, and this human, a smarter, a smarter person, will be able to make a cup of tea. But also, it still, it still can talk, it still can write, can read and can walk. So we just add new behavior to previously existing uh, creature, entity. Maybe this cup of tea metaphor is not perfect, but I hope you get the idea. Let's continue. The controller. Controller, like I mentioned before, MVC pattern. Controller is the central piece of that. So look at the left. On the left, you see an example of a controller, which if you know, maybe you've heard about this in Java, there is a, a framework which is called uh, JAX. RS. So I, it's, it more or less looks like JAX-RS API. So this JAX-RS is quite popular for designing RESTful, RESTful APIs, which probably you, you've studied before. If you didn't, then I suggest you to read about it. It's, uh, it's called RESTful API. RESTful API is um, sort of a design pattern which is used for I don't know, maybe 20 years already for web development and usually not only for web development, for, for designing web services. So when people design these web services, they may need, for example, the web service to reply, to respond to two entry points, two HTTP entry points. Let's say the entry point is index and the entry point is update. So the slash means that this, this pass is on, the, is on the URL. So basically the, the full URL will be something like this, HTTP, uh, I don't know, some name of my service, I don't know, some service.com and then slash, and then index. So this index is actually the, the here. So I specify it there, and it means that when the, the request comes in, then by the, and, and the name is the, the, the tail of the pass of the URL is, uh, is index, then we get there. Long story short, this is the simple controller with two entry points, with two access points or entry points. The request comes in, HTTP request comes in, HTTP response comes out. Usually that's the design uh, we have in uh, Java servlets, we have in this uh, API and many other places. What's wrong with that? The, the, the wrong part is that it is a controller. So again, something who doesn't know what will happen later just comes in. And this is the request. Request is a plain old data structure. Remember the quote by Carla. 
It's a plain old data structure which doesn't know what will happen. It's just a container of data. The container of data flies in. And then the controller, which is the smart procedure, takes the pieces out of this, of this request. For example, who is calling? What are the param parameters? What are the arguments? What's the, the content of the body? Whatever. So all the necessary parts, all the data is taken out. And then the decision is made, okay, how do we construct, how do we build the output page? And then the controller, again, continues to be the smart procedure. It builds the output and returns, again, the clueless, plain old data structure. So there are two anemic objects coming into smart procedure. The smart procedure does everything and they have no idea what's going on. So it's not object-oriented programming. That's my point. It may be an okay programming approach if you don't call it object-oriented programming. You can call it procedural programming pattern. Perfectly all right. Call it procedural programming pattern. Then you don't need Java. You don't need C++. You just need C. You can do the same in C language. You can do the same in languages which don't claim to be object-oriented. They don't need encapsulation for this. You don't need abstraction for this. You don't need polymorphism for that. You just need plain old data structures containing data flying in, fly down. A better approach, look at the right example here. Here we say, you know, um, we also have this because it's not a perfect example. So this question is actually for, your, for you to think more because uh, here uh, we still have the same uh, the same mechanism. We still fly in the the, the, uh, the, the the plain anemic data structure and it's coming out, but the mechanism of dispatching is changed. The dispatching means that uh, when you uh, when, when the request is coming, so here the decision of uh, of which way to go here or there, the decision is made by so probably here you need to say extends uh, something, uh, some abstract controller. Abstract controller. I didn't, I, I forgot to put it here. So this abstract controller will provide the functionality of deciding which way to go. The request should go into the first method or the request should go into the second method. So this mechanism is called routing or dispatching in, in web frameworks. The request is coming, then we need to decide left or right. So I suggest that this decision not to be uh, inside this uh, controller, inside, inside the smart, uh, smart, smart procedure. But each piece of code, each block of functionality, this one and this one, they become objects. Each of them become objects. And the larger block is also an object. So basically we create an object which encapsulates two objects. So this, this is one of them, and this is another one of them. And then we combine them into a larger one. So these all pages is an, is, a, is, a, is an object which encapsulates, look, it encapsulates one, it encapsulates two, it encapsulates both of them. So when the request comes in, it just, it makes the dispatching and then delegates the control to either one of them, either left or right. So, <clears throat> so here, what, what did we solve by this? We got rid of uh, methods inside the controller as entry points. Instead, we made them new objects. We didn't solve the problem of the, of the, of the anemic data flying in and flying out. That's a separate story. We will discuss it later. But at least we solved the, we, we, uh, we eliminated uh, the improper design uh, in the area of dispatching. We'll get back to this question when we discuss MVC. Another good example is validator. Somebody of you asked me about validating of objects, so let me touch this subject a bit with a bit more details. Look at the left. We have the special object called validator. The validator, you, you pass the age of a person to the validator and you ask whether the age is valid. So in order to, to deal with this, you need to write the code like this. Let's say the age is 23, and then we make new validator. And then I say, if not the age is valid, then I throw an exception. If the age is uh, not, if the age is uh, valid means above uh, 18 or more. So if the age is below 18, then it's not valid. So that's the, the way how people usually validate numbers. So they create validators. And these validators are 
the smart procedures, which expect the data to come in. They do the validation and return the data and return the information. Okay, yes, this data is valid or this data is not valid. A better approach is to equip an object with validating functionality. So you have an object which is, for example, age. So you have an object which is called age. And the age object is actually the object which knows the age of a person. So you, you, what it knows, it knows how to, only how to return the value. It doesn't know whether the value is valid or not. It just returns the value. The value is, the value is number five or the value is number 23. It doesn't care. It just returns the value by, by the request. You may say it's not the perfect design pattern because the data escapes, but let's say for now it's okay because the object is super primitive and all it knows is just to, is just to present the data. Let's say this is the behavior of the object. Just say that my age is uh, 23. And then you have the implementation of this interface. The implementation is this, the default age. It just encapsulates the number and returns the number. And then you create another object, which you, called, which you call a valid age. So the valid age now also overrides, redefines the functionality there, the value. But when the value is being called, then the whole validation and the exception throwing is happening there. So now you don't get the object and validate it and then continue the processing. You make the object encapsulated into the object which, which will throw an exception if the, the original object is not valid. And you pass this larger, the composite object, to where it was going. And then when somebody will later ask what is your age, then the exception will happen there. So this approach is imperative. We explicitly make the exception throw right here and now. Even though maybe here, for example, here, let's say there's an access to, access to, uh, to some sensitive data, which we don't want people, underage people to get access to. So if we go like this and everything will be okay because we check the valid we check the age right there and then we throw an exception the access will not be provided. But let's say that before this access to sensitive data we have another if which says if access is needed needed if not access is needed then just return return and then we give the access. But in this case, this validation is completely wrong because the person didn't ask for the access. So the person was just, I am, yeah, I'm like five years old or whatever, 17 years old. But we still say, hey, age is not valid, but the access was not yet requested. The access was not by the user, but we do it imperative way. So we just, in this case, in the, when, you, when we program like this, we need to always remember, keep in our head, the algorithm of evaluation, the algorithm. Remember the first lecture. We need to always remember what goes after what. The algorithm. First, we check the access. Second, we check the, the, the age. Then we give the access. If we, if we change the, the, the order, then we need to remember whether we change it the right way. So this temporal coupling between executions, between, between the algorithmic steps, will be important for us. In this case, it's absolutely not the case. Look what we do here. We create new default age, then we encapsulate it into the valid age, and pass this variable around. So the A goes everywhere, and then many, many lines of code, and at some point of time, somebody will say, A, hey, what is your age, by the way? And at this point, boom, the exception will be thrown. Only at this moment, when actually the request will be made, not before. So we need. So in this case, we may forget about the algorithm. We may not. We we don't need to remember what goes after what. We just remember that hey, this object must be protected. So this object, when somebody touches this object, always validate. Then what's inside is safe. And then you forget about it. You forget about this functionality forever. You just once, you do this once, you once encapsulate your object into valid object and pass it around.
and it goes everywhere and exception will be thrown when it's time to throw them, when actually some, some uh, illegal things will happen with the object. Let me check the question being asked there. Uh, yeah, the question is right. So uh, you're saying that the, 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 the code on the right is, the, is a straight getter masquerading the value method. Exactly, yes. Like I said, this is quite primitive example there. So that's a, that's a getter. That's definitely a getter. Uh, which we which we decorate with an, uh, with a larger functionality. But like, but like I said, imagine that this is the behavior object. I can I can change it and, and give you a better example. Let's say uh, let's say we have a class uh, we have a class user, and in the class user I have a method which is called uh, let's say uh, uh, maybe age will be too much for you. So let's say I have a user and the method called um, uh, okay maybe uh, enter sensitive area So before, if you do the validator, you will be able to, you, you will need to do, you will need to do get age from the user, pass it to the validator. The validator will say, no, the age is not valid. And then you don't enter the sensitive area. So you need to move this functionality to the procedure, to the control, to the validator, to some other place outside of an object. I am telling you, no, just decorate your object and call it valid user or protected user or safe user and then forget this don't take the data out just say enter the sensitive area and every time the user goes around your program every time you see that the, the user has to enter the sensitive area you just say user we enter the sensitive area and what happens inside you don't care if the user was decorated before and the user which comes to you is actually already decorated and it has the functionality of checking whether it's okay to enter or not. Perfect. If not, you don't care. When you deal with the user and when you actually at the point of entering some sensitive data, you don't need to remember how the user must react to the situation when the age is below 18 or whatever. That's encapsulation. That's the idea of abstraction and encapsulation. You already encapsulated this functionality into the user. It's there. You did it only once and then you pass it around and it goes around the program holding this functionality, holding this behavior and exposing this behavior when necessary. So another comment that the validation should happen right in the object. Exactly. That's the bottom line. So the validation must happen in the object, not outside. The object is responsible for its own validation, not anybody else. Like with any other behavior of the object, the object must not be responsible for its own behavior. Only the object, nobody else. There should be no validators, no parsers, no checkers, no controllers, no managers. Only the object responsible for its own behavior. And every time you, you name your object with the ER in the end, or OR, it's the same. OR, the same. Validator, uh, printer, validator, builder. Every time you see the name of an object with an ER, remember, you're doing something wrong. You're already at the route, at the path to procedural programming. Just stop right there and do something else. So the name is a hint for you. And that's actually the title, the blog post of Carla, when he says, your coding conventions are hurting you. So he's saying about coding conventions. So if you, if you, if you have a convention, if you have a habit to make objects ended with ER, then you will inevitably lead, you will inevitably lead yourself to design patterns like parser, uh, reader, controller, validator, encoder, another example encoder. So look at the example on the left, URL encoder. This is the piece from Java JDK. So look how we do it, how we encode the URL. 
So I say URL dot encoder encode. So this is the static method. Even I think it's static. Maybe I made a mistake. Maybe the static must be removed. But it doesn't matter. Again, look at this date last object. It could be static, it could be not static, it doesn't make a difference. It's the same idea. It's just, it's just a holder, it's just a name namespace for, uh, for, for, for methods, for, for procedures. And then you say, and then you say encode, and then it's gonna return you like this. A better approach would be, as you already understand, the string is not smart enough to encode itself. Okay, what do we do? We create encoded string. And the encoded string encapsulates the original string and the encoding, which is we're supposed to use. And then we override the method value. And when the value is called, then we do this, 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 this. It's not going to work in Java. You have to understand because it's not possible. You cannot write like this in Java. You cannot say implement string. That's a mistake in Java design, in my opinion. So this is the mistake of the language design. So Java was designed to make string as an immutable, not only immutable, but final uh, final uh, class which nobody can extend and if you cannot extend the string then you cannot do the, the the design which is on the right snippet but in other languages in some other languages it's possible to do it this way it's possible to extend the functionality of a string so we don't make encoders because we remember er is a problem is a is a is a bad design just by the name we don't even need to think further. We don't need to think whether encoder is a good idea. No, encoder is a bad idea. Why? Because ER is at the end. That's a simple rule, which helps you to understand whether your design is good or not. See the idea? We don't encode, we, we don't, we don't encode objects, we don't parse objects, we don't print objects, we don't read objects, we make objects which are readed, which are read, which are encoded, which are parsed. So we make additional functionality, we add additional functionality to an object. We make larger, more complex, more advanced objects. That's the idea of object-oriented programming. We take small object, not smart enough, take another object, not smart enough, put them together, create a larger object, which is smarter. Then take this one. It's not smart enough for you. Okay, put another few objects around, make a larger object. And then this one, again, not enough, not enough features, not enough behavior for you. Make even larger one. And then eventually you're going to have a large, large object which encapsulates them one by one like a Russian doll until you have, until you have a, a huge a uh, pyramid of objects, not actually a pyramid, but like a, like a Russian doll. But in the Russian doll, you have one doll, a larger, a larger, a larger. But in this case, you, sometimes you're going to have two dolls, three dolls, encapsulating many of them. So it's going to look like, it's going to look like this. We have one object, you have another one. And then these two, they have some functionality, but it's not enough for you. So you make a larger one. This one has larger functionality. And this one, so you take this one, this is even more, provides more functionality for you. Then you take another few objects like this, and then you encapsulate like this. That's even larger functionality. And then some other objects stay here, and then some other objects stay here, and then some other more objects, and then they together, and then they go together. And this is your application. And you call this is my application. So that's the object-oriented design. You compose objects into objects, always making functionality larger and larger. That's called composition, object composition. Well, you can call it dependency tree, but uh, I would suggest the term object composition because it's quite close to function com functional composition. In functional programming, you have something like this. In object-oriented programming, we have object composition. So you compose objects into objects, always thinking, I, how do I get an object with more functionality exposed? Okay, let's continue. Remember this picture. We're going to see it in the end of the lecture in practice. Another good example of, uh, a, like a, it's like a, now uh, a mirror problem, uh, a problem which is a reflection of the ER. So on the other side of this, uh, of this ER could stand a client, so-called. It's very popular uh, suffix in Java, for example, to use it for, uh, for naming objects. For example, this is a real example. Amazon S3 client. So you can, you can find this object in Amazon AWS Java, Java client library. 
That's the real name, Amazon S3 client. So you make a class, let's see, let's see how it works. So you make a class, Amazon S3 client. So this is the name of the region where your data is being stored. Then you create a bucket. Probably you know what, how S3 works. So you create a bucket. This is the name of a bucket. Bucket is where you keep the objects. The, but now objects are not the object-oriented programming objects, but objects in terms of their objects. In Amazon, they keep objects. So simply put, every object is a file. So, they, so you create a bucket. The bucket is a container of files. Then you say put object, actually put file. So this is the name of your file, name of your object. And then you write object. So this is the name of a bucket again, name of the file, and the data to save. So you talk, this is how you talk to, so this is your client, then this is internet, HTTP, and then this is AWS. So the client, this this class, and this is you, this is your application. So your application talks to the client, the client makes the HTTP request, these guys make the, the answers, then the answers goes here, and then the client returns to you and say, yes, I did it. So the client is an abstraction for you of the, the server. So we can say this is the server. Server, remember, ER. And this is the client. The client is a, the client part, the client end of the server. So when you have a client in your code, you are imagining that there is a server somewhere there. So you're imagining the second part, you're imagining that the server exists. And that's bad, right? So we don't want ER to happen in our life, ever. So a better approach would be to design it like this. So we say uh, region, we create some region with the same name. So we make some abstraction called S3 region. So we don't call it a server, we say it's a region, meaning region that's a term from AWS. So it's a place where they keep the files. And then I say, create me the bucket by this name. And I make a bucket, another object for me. And then I say, bucket, put me a file there with this name. Okay, this is the, the file, the object. And then I say, into this file, write me the data. So I don't deal with one client, which is an abstraction of a server. I get away from this abstraction as fast as possible. And I deal with objects in my code, which are abstractions of the entities on the server side. So they have files there. They have the bucket. I have a bucket. They have object. I have object. They have uh, region. I have region. So instead of making one large client as an abstraction of a server, I make many abstractions which correspond to the things on the server side. The question, you mean that client is not decomposed enough, it should be more abstractions exposed. Yes, it's not decomposed enough. And people don't even try to decompose. So this is very, very traditional design pattern. Look, they have, at the time of writing, they have even more. So I, I wrote a blog post about this long time ago. And when I was writing this, it was maybe, I don't know, maybe six years ago. Six years, six years ago. Yeah six years ago. So there was 160 methods. Maybe now if you check, you're going to have 260 methods. So imagine this is the large, huge class with more than a hundred methods. So obviously it's not object, it's not really a good object-oriented uh, pattern. It's not object-oriented practice to do it this way. You shouldn't do it like this. Why it happens? I'm not saying that, that, that it's just bad to have many methods. Of course, we, we discussed that. Having many methods is bad. But why they did it? They also understand that many methods are bad. So they're not, they're not, uh, uh, you know, they're not stupid, definitely. The designers of this AWS Java client. But they just, they're not, they're not stupid by understanding that many methods is bad. But they are not clever enough to understand that even the idea of having the client is what leads to these 160 methods. So this is why you made 160 methods, because you started with the client idea, because you started with the procedural idea. One client is an abstraction of one server. So forget about the server, try to get away from the idea of the server. Think about objects and make the objects smart enough. So I have a bucket there. Okay, I have an abstraction bucket here. 
but now I want this bucket to be able to create me new files. That's not enough functionality. Okay, I add this functionality to the bucket. Not to the server in, in, as a whole, but to the specifically one bucket. But for them, this is, not a this is not an object really. They don't think of this as an object. They think of this as a container for procedures. So for them, this guy is actually ER entity. It's actually a container of procedures. And that's why they have so many procedures. Because, yeah, it's a container for procedures. So what else do you do? You add more, you add more procedures to the container, to the, to the library, to the namespace. That's what it is for. So they feel no guilt about adding this. They feel no, uh, no guilt, right? They, feel, they don't feel bad about this. Because they, they understand that this client is just a storage of procedures, so it's okay, we're going to add these procedures. What else, right? So that's it, just one slide about client, just for you to think about this. And that's a list of things why the left snippet is, it's a summary. So the left snippet is procedural, it's hard to test, it resembles a utility class, it's hard to extend. I can talk more about this, but you can, you can, read, uh, you can read my blog post, for example, which is uh, exactly about this problem. And this code I took from there. So this code is from there, which explains, uh, which is more explained over there. Okay, what about performance? This is very traditional, typical question, but probably question number one, which people ask me. So look again at the parser on the left. We discussed the parser, we started from the parser. Look at how it looks on the left snippet here. Look there. So it's string as an integer, and it encapsulates the original string. And every time I call int value, remember, every time, it's going to parse again. Right? So I have a string. If, if I do the traditional parsing, then I have a string, I have a parser, I get the string, I pass it to the parser, parser will parse the string, end of the day. That's it. The story is finished. We don't need the parser anymore. We will never come back to the parser again. We have the result. We have the result and the result goes further in the program. Simple. Procedural, very effective. Performance is the best. Why? Because we only do it once. We take the string, parse and store the result. Here, if I do it this way, somebody later in the code, then I do n int value, What will happen? Here I will, I will do the parsing and here. The parsing will happen two times. And there is no way in this, in this example, there is no way to get rid of this. So you will definitely parse two times. And that's of course a performance problem. So we don't want this to happen. So how do we get rid of this? Look at this. What do we, let's ask the question, looking at the, of the left code. What do we miss in this uh, that's a wrong name. Sticky. Parsable object. So we look at this object, which is parsable object. It was just a string before, and now it's a string which you can parse. A string which can turn itself into an integer. What feature, what functionality do we miss in this object? What we are not happy about, what do we complain about? We miss the functionality of caching the previous result. We already asked you to parse itself. We already asked you what is the number. You already told us the number. I'm coming to you again. I don't want you to calculate again. You missed the feature. Please remember what I asked you before. It's like a human being. For example, you have a human being with a book. You come to this human and say, could you please read me the page number 17? And the human opens the book and reads the page number 17. You say, stop, enough. Then you come to this human in half an hour and say, please read me page number 17. And he opens the book again and reads you again. You say, hey, how about you become a bit more smart and don't read it again. Don't open the book. It takes too much time. Just remember what I asked you before. I ask you, what is on the page 17? You read me a few lines. Can't you remember that? This is the missing functionality. We don't solve this problem by saving this number. We don't solve this problem by, replace, by, by uh, disrespectfully uh, 
replacing the, the human being with something else. We just make this human smarter. We just say, please learn to remember what I asked you before. The same we do with an object. We create, I call it sticky object. So sticky means to you, you the answers just stick to you. So I ask you, you, you kind of answer me and stick it, like put it there somewhere inside. So you don't remember, the, return me again. And look at the functionality. So for this, we have two internal uh, two attributes, uh, the cache, so the, the value which was returned before, and the boolean flag which says, okay, was it cached or not? So when we start, the cache is false. So this, this is false, so it means that we didn't, uh, we didn't remember, uh, we didn't calculate it before. You can call it not cached, maybe calculated, maybe a better name. So you already calculate. Uh, oh yeah, sorry, that's my mistake. You just said that cached is not changed. So that's right. So here the, 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 line, is, uh, the line is missing. So we have to say cached equals to true. So this is the functionality. So I, I check if not cached yet, then I calculate it and I said cached is true. And I return the, what was calculated. So the second, the second request here, the second one, which, which will come here, will not calculate the second time. It will return what is cached. But remember that, look at what's interesting, is that this, this guy here is not parsing. The parsing functionality is encapsulated in it. So this guy is actually calculating. And here we only encapsulate. So in order to make the object, we do it like this. New sticky int new string as int. This one is this. This one is this. The functionality is split into two objects. So I had this object, but it was not smart enough for me. So what did I do? Remember the picture? I had one object. I had one object. It was not enough for me, like this one. So I encapsulated it into another one. I made it larger. I didn't touch the original object. I didn't touch this one. I didn't modify it. I said, okay, you do your job just fine. You know how to parse. You don't know how to remember. It's not your fault. You're good enough, but I need smarter partner. So that's why I create larger one, which will talk to you, which will encapsulate you. But when I talk to him, he will be smarter than you because he talks to you every time, but it, it talks to you not every time. It actually knows how to remember what you answered to it. So we have two objects. If in the future, for example, I say, you know, I don't want the object to, I don't know, but maybe in this example, it's hard to imagine what else we can add, what other functionality, but let's say, okay, let's say we need a functionality of validating. So let's say we want to parse the string, but if the string is parsed as zero, then we want to raise an exception. So how do we do it? We create another object, which will decorate this one. So it's going to be even larger with this one inside. Again, we don't touch them. We don't modify them to extend the functionality. We always try to compose a larger thing, a larger object from smaller ones. So functionality in object-oriented programming must be added to objects only by creating new objects. Not only, almost, always. Almost always, you, you should try to extend the functionality by adding new objects, by decorating what you have, by, by composing what you have into larger structures, and that's how you make functionality uh, more complex. So you try not to touch what already lives in the objects that you have. Okay? But, of course, the question is, uh, we discussed on the previous lecture, remember the thread safety. I told you that some objects are thread safe, some, some, some algorithms are thread safe, some algorithms are not thread safe. So this one on the right is not thread safe. Why? You can imagine what happens if into this object, which we just created, this one, if I come here from two different threads. This is thread number one, and this is thread number two. 
So if I come to this from two threads at the same time and say, give me the number, calculate me, do, do, the, do your work and return me the integer. So these two threads at the same time will jump into this code here. They will arrive at this code. They both will check this. They both will return zero. They will false. So both of them will know, okay, it was not parsed before. So both of them will call int value. And then both of them will return me the same value. So parsing will happen twice. There will be two threads coming in. And for both of them, the parsing will happen. And we don't want that, right? We want it to happen only once, even though they're coming from different threads. And if there are two threads, imagine there are 10 threads. So 10 threads will come in and all 10 threads will do the parsing. We don't want that to happen. So that's why we do so-called thread safety. Sticky, again, not the right name, not the parser. It should be parsable. Actually, I, I like the name parsable. I like this suffix able much more than er. So every time I see er, I'm trying to replace it with able. Parsable, printable, uh, readable, uh, savable, printable. So you have an object which is not parsable. We have an object, an object which is not readable. You have an object which is not validated. So you say validated or maybe able or maybe ed. You can say parsed as well. Parsed. Parsed, read, validated. So with the, with, the, with the ed, which means that this functionality kind of added there. So when you take something, then you kind of, kind of, it's kind of a guarantee that what's there is validated. Or you can say validatable of able or ed is a, is, a, is a good replacement for er. So look at the left code. This one you already saw. So this one is uh, not thread safe. This one is thread safe. Look at this. It's actually a good, uh, impl a better implementation than we have on the left. So there is a so-called atomic reference. Maybe some of you know this in Java. Uh, if you don't, then uh, I again suggest you to read about uh, concurrency and thread safety in, in Java. So the code there is different. Look at this method. There, we don't have... The code is different than it, it calls the cache. We, ha we have only one encapsulated here. We have two encapsulated attributes. Here we have only one, which is cache. And this cache is atomic reference. Atomic means that the functionality provided by this object is, uh, is threat safety. So there is, a, there is a guarantee that every time you touch this, uh, this atomic reference, you touch what's inside of this atomic reference, it guarantees that if many threads are doing this, it will put them into, into a line. So they will go one by one. So multiple threads will not at the same time modify what's inside. So why I'm showing you this, you can learn the code, but my point is that this is a good example of, we have one object, which is, which is, look, we have one object here, which is number, another object, which is atomic reference. And this one is the object number three. That's exactly what I showed you before. We have one object, we have another object, and the larger object combining the functionality of these two creates the object number three. It's just a better illustration because here we, we, we also have the, the three objects, but these guys are not really objects, they're data primitives. But in this example, it's a perfect example. Two objects make three. Two objects, sorry, make one. Uh, the question, uh, can we use just atomic integer? Yeah, of course. Atomic reference can be replaced by atomic integer. That's exactly the same. I just use atomic reference here to emphasize the name reference. So it's a, it's a, it's a reference to, uh, to another object. Okay. Okay, MVC. MVC, Model View Controller, model who I'm sure most of you have heard of this name. If you didn't, then you definitely need to read it. It's, it's number one design pattern in the world of web design and mobile, applica and mobile applications and uh, desktop applications. So how it works? We already discussed it briefly. I showed you the controller. This is another example of uh, a, a bit larger controller, which is a classic example of using a model and a view. So the controller is the guy who is in control, who is in charge, and look what it does. That's the entry point. 
we can we get in there with the control we, we get in there there with the uh, with the request and uh, it's a simplified very simplified example but uh, it should it should give you the idea of what it is so the id is coming here so id is supposed to be taken from the from the pass so let's say we want to read the book so our url is this b i don't know one two three so this is the the url which is coming which is uh, the web uh, the web application is entering this is is, ex, ex, is uh, accepting the request by this url so what do we do first we go into some entity manager remember from the previous lecture the orm so we go to some entity manager we find the object by id this object is of course dto so this is data transfer object the the, the, the anemic structure then we create some kind of a view so this view is basically taking encapsulating the some html template and then into this view we inject we say okay title is and then from the book we retrieve the title from the book and inject into the view and we ask the view okay render itself into html and we return the result so we enter here we go to the model the, we go to we go to some entity manager the entity manager returns us the model by the model they call this book dto it comes in here from here we inject here the title into the view and then the view gets rendered into html and we return html here so the controller magically dispatches the things take the data uh, inject into the view uh, render the view send the view out send the, the html out this is all done by the controller why it's bad i told you because first of all this model is anemic anemic it doesn't know what's going on the view doesn't also doesn't know too much about what's going on and the controller so in the end let's talk about practical problems the practical problem is this the controller becomes huge the model is thin the view is this is thin this is huge and the view is uh, about this i can't say too much so but the, the main problem is that this is huge and this is thin so we have huge controllers which are many 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 lines of code and we have very thin model which doesn't know nothing about anything it's just a just a plain simple uh, data structures so that's what that's what i believe uh, is the main practical problem of mvc of mvc design pattern it just it just it just leads to huge controllers why because because the model doesn't because the model doesn't help us at all we don't let the model help us we don't let the model know uh, anything about uh, what's going on what is the better alternative i suggest and you can take it how it's designed I, I i give you the links of two repositories this one is very primitive small just a few java files but you can take the idea quickly you can grasp the idea in just a few minutes maybe a few hours but here it's a lot it's quite large web framework with uh, with users with the history it's i don't know, maybe seven years old on github so we use it in many applications it does what i'm suggesting you to do so instead of this code which i just showed you on the previous slide i suggest this one so you say you first of all you design the book as an interface then you create a book this is sql speaking object so this sql speaking so this, this object knows about the data and knows how to retrieve it from the database as we discussed in the previous lecture then we have an interface page so we say there's a page on the internet which 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 is visible on the web it's something which is with an HTML. So this is the only property of the, of the interface is HTML. So it can render itself. And then you create HTML book, which implements at the same time two interfaces. It's at the same time the book and at the same time a page. So we make an object which behaves both like a book and then the page on the internet. It has two, two, uh, methods 
And of course, in order to implement these two methods, it will definitely need to use uh, this class. And it will definitely, definitely need to use some kind of a view inside, some HTML templating engine or whatever. And then we have a page on pass which encapsulates the, um, uh, the dispatching mechanism. The mechanism which decides if the request is coming to me, then I will answer it. If the request is coming not to me, then I will not answer it. I don't think that I will be able to explain you any further with more details in this short lecture, but I strongly suggest you to take a look at these two repositories. You start from here, that will take you maybe one hour, and then you start, you go to there, that will take you maybe a few days, and then you will understand what I mean. You understand what is the replacement for MVC, because these are not MVC, not MVC. We have no controllers. We have no controllers. We, of course, we have the functionality of controlling. We cannot design a web application without the dispatching mechanism, for example, without the, the decision to be made whether this page is required, is requested, or that page is requested. So this functionality definitely is needed. But this functionality is spread among objects. It doesn't stay in some one single, single controller. It doesn't stay in some controllers. It just spread among objects. If the object is responsible for the book, then this object decides whether to show what is needed for this book or not. And I will show you by a practical example. Now we go into the coding part of this lecture, the final part. I will show you two, uh, two open source uh, applications. This is the application. This is the application. And this is the framework which, uh, which is used by the application. Framework. Okay, let me share my, my code with you. Let's start from here. So we have, this is an object which is called TKAAPP. So this is the, the, the object which is an abstraction of the entire web application. Entire application. That's why it's called APP. TK means take. So that's the prefix for the take. Take is like a page. Before we were talking about pages, in the, in the takes framework, we have takes. So one take, another take, another take. You can think of them as like, as like pages. So here we construct the, uh, the page. So we have, let's say, for example, this is, this is the page, this is the take constructed by composing, by, by, as we, be, like we discussed before, composing objects into objects into objects. I'm interested to show you this one. So this is the small, again, another decorator, another wrapper of the existing object, which does a very simple, which adds a very simple functionality to the object. So that's it. That's the whole size of an object. It, this application, this application if you ask this application, if you, there's only one method actually, you can say act. So there's only one method act. So you can, you can, you build this object and then you say act and you push the request there and it returns the response. The request is, again, remember it's a, it's an, it's an anemic, anemic model here, unfortunately. So you push the request there with the information of what is requested, like the URL and the, the, the HTTP method and all that information. And you get back the response, which contains the HTML page. Simple as that. And now we want, and this application, this functionality is not enough for us. What do we miss? We want when the HTTP response is coming out, is coming, is coming back to us, we want an additional HTTP header to be attached to this response with the information about how long time it took to build the page. Simple as that. So let's say you have an application, web application, and you want it to reply back to you, respond back to you with this additional information uh, which you want to see. How much time it took? How do you do it? You add this, you don't touch the application. Like I told you, you don't touch the application, you don't modify it, you just, deck, you just wrap it into additional object. And we created an object for this called TK measured. So TK measured when the request is coming. So basically TK measured is doing something like this. So I can 
this functionality may be Oh, I can modify it. So uh, this TK measured, this is the whole functionality of the of this decorator. So it's it's it 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 measures it it remembers what was the time when I started it. Then it calls the act method of the original object, which is encapsulated. And then when the response is returned, in it adds the the header. This is the name of the header. So it puts this name of this this header to the response, and the number goes in there. And this is the way you add, okay, another decorator. So in this case, we want our application, web application, to return the result, the HTTP response, and compress it. Use G, gzip uh, algorithm to compress the output before it gets delivered to, it gets delivered to, uh, to the end user. So how do we do this? We don't touch the application, we don't modify it, we just do a decorator, which is called tkzip. tkzip does that. It again calls the original encapsulated uh, take, it asks it, okay, make me the response, and then it returns the response according to whether the gzip was requested or not. So it, it, it returns the response, which is decorated by gzip response. Look at this. This is, a, this is a static method, which is introduced only for the sake of readability. The actual code is like this. The actual code would look like that. So this is the full application you can, you can you, the full application in this framework. That's the entire APP. So we make one large object, just like I promised you. Remember the picture, object and object, composed into a larger one. A larger one composed into a larger one. A larger one composed into a larger one. And then, when everything is composed, I can do this here, dot, act, and it will behave like a web page. And here, what, what, is, what, is the, what is the, how do we do the dispatching? So look, this is the object called TK fork. So TK fork is also a take, so I can also act, I can also call act on it. So it's also a take, something which responds to requests. And it encapsulates the so-called fork objects. FK fork stands for fork. Fork by regular expression. So if I request the robots, then it will go into the empty string. If you request me this, it will dispatch to the takes, which is called TK takes. Here you see I also can call act. So here on this page, I see everything. I see everything which, which constitutes uh, my, ap my application. All elements of it. I don't see any hidden parts of the code anywhere. I don't, I don't have any annotations. If you compare this with a Spring framework, for example, in Java, where absolutely impossible to understand what the application consists of. Like, where are the parts? What is going to be executed behind the scene? Here, nothing is behind the scene. I built my application myself from all the pieces which, are, which, are, which will work. So everything is built, in, everything stays in front of me. All the parts. I'm thinking which part of this code I, I want to explain to you. So we, when, when we design the application like this, we always go from small, from, from the elements, from the pieces, into larger and larger elements. And then the larger element, when the functionality is missing, then we go even further, then we go even higher. So we always try to, like in the picture I showed you, we always try to look at the object, and when the object is not giving us enough features, we just decorate it with a larger one. I, I keep using the word decorating because most of these guys are decorators. So if you click at this, you will see that it, it's a take that implements a take. So when you create an object which implements a take, and well, sorry, it implements the take, I said it wrong, it implements take and it encapsulates take. 
So if you see this, it's a decorator. When it behaves like a take, and it encapsulates a take. If it behaves like some, some type, and it encapsulates a, very, a field and the attribute of this type, then it means it's a decorator. And everything is designed in these decorators there. So I, I'm a big fan of this decorator pattern. Uh, that's why maybe that's why in our replication we have it. But I think it's a good pattern because what it does, you have an object which is something for you. For example, it's a, it's a string or it's a, it's a stream or it's a file or it's a, it's a page on the web, which we call take. So you, 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 ex you expect it to behave some way and then it doesn't behave for you this way. So what do you do? You create another object which is also a take for you, which is also the same type for you. But the additional functionality is added. For example, look at this, TK version. This one simply adds this header to the response. And this header is built like this. So it basically builds the string and uh, makes the, when the response is delivered, then the string is added to this. And we just decorated the entire application. The entire, because entire application is just an object. It's just a take. So you can say it's a dependency tree, or you can say it's a, like a Russian doll, or you can say it's a, it's a hierarchy of object composition. You call it whatever you want. But the idea is that uh, we see the entire functionality there. And I can tell you that this entire functionality is... Uh, if this, this object is TKAPP, let's see where it's being used. Uh, here, let's see who is making it. Entry. So we have an entry point to the application. So this is the exact method, which is, uh, which is called by the main method. So in Java, this is the entry point. So the entry point goes into this method, exact. It prepares something here, prepares, prepares. And finally, it says, make me the new application, TKAPP, with three objects encapsulated inside. So this is the abstraction of the database. This is the abstraction of some uh, routine which, uh, which, which runs in the background. And this is the abstraction of the, of the parameters of the configuration file. So basically three elements goes inside. And this is the entire application which you create. And this application goes into the object which is called FTCLI. It basically stands for front and CLI for command line interface. So into this one we encapsulate an APP which is a take. So remember, there's a method act, so it can act, so you can always call it, you know, make them call to the method act. And this FTCLI, what it's going to be, it's going to start, uh, it's going to open the server socket. On this socket, it's going to bind, it's going gonna, it's gonna to start listening on this socket. And when the request is coming, it's going to, in multiple threads, it's going gonna, gonna to call this method. It's going to call act, 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 and the response will be, coming will be coming back, and it will send this stuff into the socket. If you want to see how it works, you just click it there, and you see exactly what I just told you. It starts the, there's a, there's a BK, BK stands for background, so it starts the, the front, FT basic, it encapsulates another one, FT basic. This one starts socket, socket timeout. The socket, ah, so it encapsulates the server socket, look. So can you do in just two clicks, in any web application which you develop, in two clicks, get into the point where the server socket is started? I doubt it. Try to do it in Spring Framework. Try to do it in, in some other framework. Here we see everything so clearly. So I can see exactly how the application is composed, from what parts. There is nothing hidden, nothing is happening behind the scene, nothing is happening by some background processes which we don't, which we don't see. Some configuration, uh, some reflection API, some class, some, some class pass scanning and annotations and, uh, and some magic. Here I can, I can write just a few clicks and, I can, and, I, and you see exactly where the server socket is started, how the server socket is configured, and then the loop which does which is waiting for the socket to, uh, to get the connection. And then you see the accept. The accept method will accept the, uh, accept the, the request and dispatch them into, into the right direction. So you can play with this application or you can play with the takes framework. I suggest you try to take a look. Uh, the overall idea is that 
controllers are uh, have no place uh, in this have no place in this type of design we have some questions there what is the general purpose of a take interface the take interface is, is, a, is, a, is a page on the web we're designing the web framework so the take is a page on the on the screen on the on the on the web it's a it's an answer to http request let's put it this way thank you very much i hope i cleared some uh, cleared this idea to you maybe i missed something but you should remember one important thing when there's an er then you do procedural programming and we are against procedural programming we're trying to do object-oriented programming